So we're going we're to talk again about the, looking at particularly the immune responses, both in the cow and the calf, so sort of both sides of the fences. We're going to, um, I always give credit, I'm going to not have too many animations today, I just have a single animation from Mark Jenkins uh, from the University of Minnesota, but certainly uh, I've got a number of people I've discussed what I'm going to talk about today, because as uh, Bobby mentioned, <coughs> every year I have, for the last five or six years, I participated in one of the, in that ABP uh, pre-symposium on on, uh, on heifer rearing, uh, and so with so Sandra Godden, uh, uh, with 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 Bob, uh, we've got uh, we've added a few new, new folks uh, to that uh, list as well. But uh, I've always enjoyed that uh, seminar. I always th th that uh, sells out, uh, and even the, it's, I was interesting. I'm I'm on the program committee for ABP, and, and every year they say, well, we want to have new things on it, and you know, so you know, out with the old, but th this one always continues to sell out, so it, it's uh, still there. So <clears throat> we're going to talk uh, right up front about sort of about how a vaccine works, and then we're going to talk about particularly about the mucosa uh, and, and the microbiome. We're going to spend some time on that and talk about stress, and then at the, at the last part of the talk, we'll talk about vaccine approaches as it relates particularly to uh, looking at, at rodent uh, Crohn and E. coli. So first of all, just a, a few definitions. So we're going to start out with something here that, that certainly you all understand well, and that is uh, the difference between active and versus passive immunity. Uh, so again, when we vaccinate animals, what we're, again, we're trying to do is to get an active response uh, that we know that that animal hopefully is going to generate memory and that it's going to, it's going to give that animal some duration of, of immunity. Versus passive, which we know again is going to be preformed immunity uh, that's going to come from another source. So if it can colostrum from the from the, from the mama cow, uh, or you know, it can be synthesized or whatever, but again, that, that, ha that has a fixed life in terms of how long that lasts. And the other thing that we know about passive antibody, and this is, this is you know, kind of interesting what we understand, if you look in, in people, it turns out that a large share of the antibodies actually crosses the placenta. And of course, the difference is that we're dealing with just four layers between the, the uterus and the, and the babe, uh, in terms of people and in mice, but with cattle and domestic animals, we're looking at six layers. So that's why um, you know, calves are born what we call a gamma globinemic, which means they have no antibody at all. Uh, and so again, colostrum ends up being essential to be able to, to, to provide that opportunity to give that animal protection. And then we have you know, therapeutic passive antibodies. Again, these are antibodies that are, against, that, that are selectively, um, so you, know, you can have sort of polyclonal antisera, but these are antibodies that are directed against specific uh, pathogens. And again, typically, uh, so rabies has been one, in, you know, one of the big ones. And it, when, when I was, went to that school uh, only, almost 40 years ago, um, we took the rabies vaccine, and it was made out of, a, out of duck eggs. And the, and the interesting thing was, about 50% of our, my class actually seroconverted to rabies, okay? Where now we have the, the Mariel vaccine, which is made out with human cells, in which the conversion rate is well over 90%. And so the, the use of antisera was something that, that occurred, and again, it was oftentimes, it was in, that, in the case of rabies, it was often equine serum. And so one of the things that you, that you, that you realize is when you re receive a foreign antibody, so if you take an antibody from a horse and you put that into a calf, Eventually, that calf will form an antibody against that horse antibody because it is foreign, even though you know, it recognizes the pathogen you're after. Typically, what you're after is just not giving it so many times that that happens. So that's what the term that we use, serum sickness, in terms of they actually get, they develop antibodies against the other species, and that ends up uh, causing, can cause us problems. So just to remind you a little bit about sort of immunology 101 in terms of what antibody looks like and what's important. So remember, it's a Y-shaped molecule. Uh, it has uh, the business end, the part that actually binds the antigen, uh, is, is concern, concern, or con, uh, a heavy chain and a light chain. So they, they grab onto the, the antigen there. Uh, the interesting thing, though, that we probably don't think a lot about is the other end of that molecule. And, that, and that's the part that we call the FC part. Okay, and that's uh, so it stands for the constant part. And that's the part that actually will allow the antibody to not only neutralize, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but also to cause it actually to, to turn on a type of cell-mediated immunity. Uh, and so that makes <clears throat> the, the FC portion really important from that standpoint, because there's a number of, whether it's eosinophils or neutrophils or natural killer cells, that take advantage of that, they'll actually arm themselves by putting an antibody on, this, on the surface, and we call that antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So again, they use the antibody as a receptor, uh, but that only happens in the same species. So again, if I give them equine serum, those antibodies can't be used that way. 
If I give them uh, uh, hand egg, first of all, that's not absorbed very well, that too would not react. The only thing that's going to actually be able to participate in this would actually be uh, uh, serum that's, that's derived from the bovine. So if we, again, if we look at, so, so you know, we, we give this, the antibody, what's the major functions of the antibody? Well, certainly a lot of the time that we've talked about is in terms of agglutination, the idea that it sticks to them uh, and causes them to uh, either be you know, further recognized by the immune system or to be neutralized, so again, to prevent them from actually uh, in infecting. Uh, and we'll talk about IgA a little bit later for, for you know, further down the line, but what we're talking about here, especially when we're talking about colostrum, is we're talking about IgG. Okay. So the other thing, again, back to species specific, is that when you look at the activation of complement, which is important for a number, for a number both for viruses and bacteria, because you'll often see when you um, send in a test and you want to get a neutralization titer, they always will do, they'll actually take the serum and they always do one thing to it every time. And that is they, they heat and activate it. In other words, they'll heat up to about 65 degrees to make sure that all the complement that's in there has been inactivated. Okay? And that's, that's to kind of keep everything even. But in the, re the real world, complement is there, and complement actually makes antibodies work better. But again, it will only work with the same species. Okay? So if I'm, if I'm giving bovine antibody to a, to a bovine, then bovine complement will bind to it. But if I have a different species, that's not going to have an effect on that. So that complement activation ends up being important. And complement is actually goes out until you got into the respiratory tract. So the idea that you've got antibody out there already to work with that, in fact, does occur. And then we know it's also in terms of uh, uh, in, in act, you know, activ activating some of the other uh, defense mechanisms that are that in terms of inflammation. And then uh, here, and I've already mentioned this already, is the idea, again, that it sticks to, to any, and here actually we're looking at a neutrophil, but again, it actually will stick to them on that FC receptor, that constant part, and actually then allow them to stick to antigens to, again, allow those cells to actually kill that or to, to, uh, to lyse that. So that's, that's an important, again, another thing that we don't think about antibody. I think most of us think about antibody kind of over here. The idea, well, what, what it does is just neutralize. Well, it does a lot of other things as well. And again, this is uh, another slide that shows you basically looking at the idea of, of agglutination or binding, and that's what we see here, the idea that it's sticking to it. But again, when we turn on complement, we've got to have bovine, bovine antibody to turn on bovine complement to actually get the lysis that we're after. And there's probably some species specificity too as well with macrophages in terms of, again, there's FC receptors on these macrophages. So again, they will be enhanced by, again, by using antibody that's from the same species. Okay, a little bit more about uh, sort of antibody in, in immunology 101, and that's just to remind you a little bit about the, about the classes of antibody. So again, when we look at <clears throat> the antibody that's in colostrum, it's almost all IgG1. Okay, so it's almost all IgG1. Uh, this antibody is good at uh, uh, binding to FC receptors, so it's, again, it's important for phagocytosis. Uh, it does a, a pretty good job in terms of turning on complement and any other major antibody that we have, uh, again, in cattle is IgG2, which does, uh, uh, you know, and, and doesn't cry, this is, again, this is a, this is a human table, but again, th does an okay job on complement, an okay job on, on the FC receptor, but again, it, the IgG1 is really important in terms of, of turning that on. And, and we get that we know that's, uh, you know, an antibody that's predominantly in the serum, okay, uh, and that uh, we want to have higher levels of that. And the other thing about it that's interesting is that if you look at its half-life, okay, so here you look at how long that antibody lasts. It's around 21 days in terms of how long it lasts, either IgG1 and IgG2. Uh, and you can see IgA is much shorter. IgM is even shorter. Okay, so that's another thing about IgG, the idea that it's at higher levels and it also has a higher half-life. So again, that's, that's important to us. Now, the next antibody that we're going to talk about is IgA, and then we'll talk a little bit about IgM too. So IgA, when it comes to actually the blood, and certainly the colostrum is a non-factor, okay? IgA, there's almost no IgA in colostrum, but IgA is incredibly important to that animal, particularly for active immunity, okay? So <clears throat> IgA, when we're talking about here, this is in the serum, but when I take it, and we'll see this in a little bit, when I take IgA and I add some other th structures to it that are, occur in the mucosa, something called a J chain and a secretory piece, I change that half-life dramatically so they can go actually go out onto the, into the intestinal tract or the respiratory tract and be out there kind of a greeting party to actually neutralize uh, uh, things before they come in. So whether it's a virus or bacteria. So IgA uh, is very good at that when it's secreted. So what we're looking at here is just in the serum and that's not 
that doesn't tell us really what's going on. And the other thing, which is sometimes you'll see people do, uh, and, and that is that they'll, they'll tell you about what the IGA level is in the serum. And what I'm going to tell you is that has almost no reflection on actually what's going on in mucosa. Okay? Um, and that, those two don't correlate very well at all, at all. On the other hand, the levels that we have of IgG1 in particular that are in the serum correlate very well to what colostrum levels will be. Because what happens is when colostrum is made, and again, we'll see this a little bit later, is that, that literally those FC receptors are grab onto this antibody and then bring it to the mammary gland. Okay, so in that case, it does correlate very well. And the last thing that we see up here is IgM. And IgM is the first antibody. So when, when, an, when an animal sees an antigen for the first time and has memory for that, the first antibody that's produced is IgM. And then it dramatically switches them by class switching to IgG or IgA or hopefully not IgE. Okay, so IgE, remember, is associated with um, allergy. The thing about, about IgM is th this thing has got, this is there's five molecules that are bound together. And the thing about the immune system, it doesn't like things in clumps. So it, likes, it has a tendency to want to eliminate them, and that's why the half-life of IgM is, so, is relatively low, okay? it's because, it, because the immune system doesn't like to see things in clumps because they know that can cause problems, so it tries to eliminate those. But again, it's always the first antibody that we have is going to be IgM. So, um, so that. And, then, and then if it, you know, the animal uh, is, gets the right kind of exposure, uh, we can see IgE. And again, we're trying to avoid that as much as we can in terms of at least allergy. <clears throat> so again, 80% of the serum is an IgG monomer, so it just occurs as that nice little Y molecule. Um, then IgM, this pentamer. Uh, about 5% of the total of antibody is that. And then the monomer is the only thing that occurs in serum. So it's not the dimer that we have on mucosal surfaces, uh, but because the dimer is the key thing here. Uh, and so, again, we want to have as much dimer as we can that's actually going to go to the surface. And it represents about 75% of all the antibody in an animal's body is IgA, the, the secreted IgA. Uh, and again, we're trying to have a, a low amount of Ig, and IgD is just an antibody that's sort of there at the beginning, uh, seen with IgM. Not important in terms of the biology of the animal whatsoever. It's just there in terms of telling us that the T B cells have been turned on. And here's just a picture again. We're looking again at the, that molecule I showed you earlier. So here we see IgG. And again, this is the business end, the part that, that binds the antigen. Uh, and then this is the FC part. And again, I just put this up to, in comparison to what we see with, so this is uh, egg yolk, so this is from chickens. Uh, and again, they'll have, this part of it will certainly be, do what it's supposed to do. This part won't interact at all, though, with, the, with bovine cells. Uh, and again, it's not very well absorbed. And then to give you, so now you can say you learned something new today, because I can't imagine there's too many people in here that work with camels. But uh, up here, this is, this is, it's been discovered. So you notice that for immunoglobulins, we've always talked about two chains here, the heavy and the light chain that form a pocket for the, for the antigen to bind in. But it turns out that camels actually only need one chain. And there's actually, and so the interesting thing is there, people aren't immunizing camels, but they figured out how to, how to make these. And actually, there's a number of human therapeutics that use that because obviously it's easier if I've only got to have one chain rather than two. So they're doing things in terms of tumors and uh, other things, some human therapeutics that actually use what we've learned from the camel. And down at the bottom here, you just see some, some different combinations because, again, the business end is this part here. So here you see actually where you can do some either via uh, uh, chemistry or actually synthesis where you just you know, get that part that's actually going to bind to the antigen. So the, get, the thing about non-bovine antibodies, again, is that so equine, again, slightly different classes, uh, maybe absorbed to some degree early. Uh, and the FC portion doesn't bind to the FCR por portion of bovine cells. On the other hand, egg, a chicken egg is not absorbed at all, and the FC portion also doesn't bind to the FC receptor on the bovine cells, because again, it's a different species. Okay, so let's talk now about, um, so we've sort of laid out the, our fundamental definitions about immunoglobulin and, and what we understand about them. So now let's talk about what do we need to do to, to vaccinate that animal to get a good immune response. And this is a slide actually courtesy of Brian Miller, uh, and so, the, again, the goal of vaccination is to immunize. And, again, the, the big difference, and, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, vaccination is just the idea that, I, that I, either I gave them an intranasal vaccine or I delivered that vaccine. But what it doesn't tell me, it doesn't tell me whether the animal even saw that vaccine, and that's immunization. 
So that's again where I know I get an appropriate immune response following a vaccine administration that provides protection against the disease. That's what we're after. Okay. And we know again there's a big difference between these two things. And so environment, pathogen, host factors all influence how many vaccines truly become immunized. And I think that's one of the things with producers, the idea that if we lay a needle on an animal, well that means that animal is, is it's, it is vaccinated, but it may not be immunized. All right, so uh, this, so we're gonna look at what happens then once we administer a vaccine. So the first thing, we'll talk about the barrier uh, extensively here in a little bit later, but uh, the first thing that has to happen, so whether I'm given an oral vaccine, an intranasal vaccine, or a parental vaccine, is that the, that antigen has to get past the barrier and it has to interact with the innate immune system. So the innate immune system, with, via macrophages and some other antigen presenting cells, its job is to be in a surveillance mode. It's like a smoke alarm. So what it does is it just, it, they're hanging out, they're waiting to see if the right kind of danger signals come along, and when they do, they spring into action, and using these inflammatory cytokines, then they do, they recruit cells in, they begin to attack the pathogen that they're after, but they also then, through, via inflammation, send signals to the body that says, hey, I need to turn on other parts of the immune system, and particularly the adaptive immune system. So this system has no memory, it's always there, certainly affected by stress, and we'll talk about that later. It can really be kind of in one direction or the other, that this system is really very prone to what stress can do to it. Uh, but it's absolutely essential that if we're gonna have a vaccine response that we turn innate immunity on, get inflammation, because that's required to turn on adaptive immunity, and that's the part that we think about when we think about memory. Okay, so we're talking about T cells and B cells, specificity, so it's again, you know, very specific parts of BBD or very specific parts of brucella, whatever, whatever we're immunizing with, uh, and we have memory. If there's a duration of immunity, and those animals are protected for some, for some period of time, and again, these things are hand in glove, so if I don't see an innate immune response, particularly the first time I give a vaccine, so if I don't see some of the things that we're gonna talk about here in a second, I'm, I really wonder whether or not that animal truly is gonna become immunized, okay? It may be vaccinated, but, but, may, but uh, not immunized. All right, so, so here you see that macrophage again out there in that patrolling mode. It picks up, here's the vaccine. Uh, it, it recognizes that and it begins by producing these inflammatory cytokines, which is what we see here, and basically, we see things happen at three levels, okay? So the first level is what we're seeing right here. So again, let's imagine we're given a parental vaccine and I see that localized swelling, that's what we're seeing here. The idea that we're producing those inflammatory cytokines, they recruit in cells, that gives me that little, that little bump that I see there that gets, it's, and I see, see some uh, heat uh, because again, I'm, I'm activating that. Now the second thing, which is absolutely essential, is the activation of regional lymph nodes or lymphoid follicles if we're talking the mucosal surface. Because the T cells and B cells, they're not out here. All the action when we're talking about vaccine happens in lymph nodes, okay? So if that lymph node isn't activated, you're not gonna see much of a response. Or if that lymphoid follicle in the, in the mucosa isn't turned on, you're not gonna see much of a response. So that's the second thing that has to happen. So we have a, a local response, a regional response, and then we have a systemic response. <clears throat> so the systemic response, there's two parts of this I'm gonna talk about right now. Uh, and that's the part that has to do with the central nervous system and the bone marrow. We'll talk about the liver a little bit later. <clears throat> because as far as the vaccine response goes, I don't want the, the liver involved at all, if I can. Because the liver uh, is a good metabolism machine. It's not a great immune organ for vaccine responses. So when I administer that vaccine, and again, particularly on the first dose, uh, and I'm, I'm given a, a, you know, a gram negative or I'm given a, a, a modified live viral, uh, I get the production of these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, and what they do is they, they affect the central nervous system really at sort of three major areas. So one is appetite. So one of the things that do is, if, again, if you've ever had the real influenza, you know, you've lived through this. You don't feel like eating anything. You ache all over, okay? So the first thing is inappetence. The second thing is listlessness, okay? So they, because they, they affect the activity center. And the third thing is sweats or a febrile, febrile response. And we know these guys by themselves, okay, so no infection, can give you fevers of 104 to 106. So I just take IL-1, give it IV to a cow, I can get that cow to have 104 to 106 without doing anything else to her, okay? <clears throat> okay, the other part of the equation though, the, the part that we don't see but it's really essential, is what happens in the bone marrow, okay? Because so, so in, in cattle, like all domestic animals, all of the, of the immune development and all the stem cells and all that is in the bone marrow. So again, these inflammatory cytokines then go into the bone marrow to get things going there. 
uh, so that they can get white cells uh, mobilized, so I can get T cells and B cells moving out, so they have the opportunity for, to have my vaccine work. Okay, so again, when we talk about, you know, we give a vaccine and we turn on innate immunity, I'm expecting that I should see some kind of pro-inflammatory response, at least on the primary, the first time that I give it to them. I should expect some side effects, and if I give it to them and it's so smooth that there's no response, I'm really wondering, okay, I vaccinated the animal, did I immunize it? And, that, and, that's, you know, that, and that's the million dollar question. Or another way to look at this is when you vaccinate, if nothing happens, again on the primary, and again, parental vaccines, nothing happened. Because typically the mucosal vaccines don't see a lot uh, uh, in terms of, 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 of sort of systemic responses. It's a pretty well localized response, it's pretty well graduated, which again, kind of gives us an issue about, well, did they really get vaccinated? And I think, you know, and then we don't have great ways or get immunized, we don't have really great ways other than actually measuring IgA to give you an answer. Because for a lot of these, pulling a serum antibody is going to tell you nothing because you don't get a systemic response. You only see a local response. So that's been kind of one of the issues. And not saying that mucosal vaccines, I like mucosal vaccines. It's just how do I tell you how good they're working without actually measuring secretory IgA. So again, if I vaccinate them on the, again with parental vaccine first time around, I see a droopy ear. I'm not getting too excited about that. Listlessness, because again, I'm turning on this sickness behavior that comes from pro-inflammatory cytokines. But I see down and out. Four feet up in the air is not a good thing. And of course, in dairy cows, we can see things like you know, drop in, in uh, tests and or production. Again, trying to minimize that. Uh, but again, when I see that, at least I know from the immune system standpoint that I've engaged the immune system. So my chances of have been at that animal actually being immunized have increased. Okay, so let me show you, and I'll show you this movie a couple times. And uh, we're just about to the end of my slides on, on the vaccine response. What we're looking at here is we're looking at a drain lymph node, because remember, that's where the action is. Uh, here are dendritic cells right here, uh, and they are going to pick up you know, the, the vaccine engine, bring it to the lymph node, and uh, the T cells and B cells all coming from the bloodstream. So everybody comes together in the lymph node to make things happen. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see cells come in here, and initially what you're going to see are antigens not there. So again, let's imagine we're vaccinating for BBD. And the cells are going to come in here looking for BBD antigen, and it's not there, what do they do? They, they're going to leave. And then we'll see the va vaccine will come in, and then we'll see what happens. And, and like I said, I'll play this for you a couple times. And this is from uh, Mark Jenkins at the University of Minnesota. So <clears throat> what you're seeing, and so dendritic cells or these antigen-presenting cells are picking up antigen. They come to the lymph node. So here you see the T cell looking around for its antigen. Here's a B cell. Their antigen's not there. What are they going to do? Go back into the bloodstream and see if they can go to another lymph node and find their antigen. All right, so now we're going to see the vaccine come in. And the vaccine antigen actually, in terms of the lymphatics, it gets to the lymph node really pretty fast. But the key here is that inflammation occurred where I initially gave the vaccine, and that makes this cell particularly adept at being able to activate T cells, okay? So this cell needs to be able to have a longer activation time, and that occurs when you have a, a mammoth macrophage or a dendritic cell that's seen inflammation, and now we see T cells begin to divide. And then they come over to look to see if there's a B cell that recognizes the same antigen, and then they provide a signal for that. So now those cells begin to divide, and now I'm going to have a B cell come down here and become a plasma cell and make antibody. And now I have developed my immune response from vaccination. Okay. All right, so, and Mark Jenkins has a great sense of humor. Uh, so let's look at that one more time. Okay, so again, draining lymph node. Initially, our antigen's not there. <clears throat> Here are dendritic cells circulating, coming into, into the lymph node. Here's a, here's a T cell, here's a B cell. Again, you saw them, they come from the bloodstream, and then they leave by the lymphatic, go back into the bloodstream, and then circulate around again. And again, this, by, by this lymph node being activated, you're going to be able to direct more T and B cells into that lymph node. Okay, just by, by definition, the, you have a, an increase of, of ability of, the, of these cells to be recruited into that draining lymph node. So now what you see is, yeah, the antigen got in here, but only until this guy up here, the one who actually saw the inflammation comes in, do I actually see the, the, what I call the dance, where these cells have to stay together for about two or three hours, not for a few minutes or a few seconds, but a few hours. And then you see T cells begin to divide. And then once I have enough T cells, they come over and bump into a B cell. And then they get the B cell, the signal that it needs, and now I get my full-blown vaccine response. Most of the antigens that we deal with are called T-cell dependent. And that means that I gotta have T-cells first 
before I get B cells. So when you look at, at kind of the, what we call the vaccine profile. So after I give a vaccine and I look at the, the T cell response and the B cell response, on a primary vaccination, what happens is, first of all, I get T cells about five to seven days after I vaccinate. They'll be the first ones up. And then antibody comes up after that. But once that animal's vaccinated and I got plenty of memory cells there, they can actually be activated directly. But on the, on the primary immunization, there's a, there's a gap there. So you're going to have first T cells, and then you're going to have B cells and antibody. So, and they're always going to be in that order. <coughs> now, once I have gotten those two together, so I got that antigen presenting cell, that dendritic cell or macrophage together with the antigen, and I activate the T cells, and I do a good job of activating them, then I establish what we call a clone of memory T cells. And the key here, though, is how good a job did I do in terms of turning these on? Because if I get above this line right here, this threshold of pr pr protection, those animals, in most cases, we're talking about memory that will last those animals months and probably years, okay? I, I would contend that we underestimate by a lot what the duration of immunity is in cattle, okay? Because all we, you know, what, th those studies are expensive. Uh, and I can, only, I, I can give you an example. We did a study I had a, had a guy wanted to work on a master's degree. He was a practicing veterinarian in, in Platt, South Dakota. And he, and he had, for a client, another veterinarian who happened to marry very nicely because his wife was the second largest landowner in the state of South Dakota. And they had 1,200 cows and they had owned everything around them. So the biosecurity wasn't a big issue. And then the question they asked was, if we vaccinate calves or cow, cows every year, every third year, What's going to be the effect on reproduction? Now, again, we're talking about beef cows here, okay? And so what they, what they saw in that particular uh, experiment, which we ran for five years, is there was absolutely no difference. And the interesting thing was, so this, this is from 98 to 2002, at the time when we had no type 2 BVD vaccines, okay? BVD was just emerging, and in the year 2000, because every year what we would do is we would take a certain percentage of the cows, we would bleed them all, and anything that was culled, we would bleed as well and do serology looking for IBR and BVD and BRSV. And the interesting thing was in 2000, we saw these cows go from no, basically no BVD type 2 to having huge titers of it. Now, the interesting thing is they were, they were vaccinated with Express. Okay, Express has got Singer in it, <coughs> excuse me. And I think... One of the things that I think we misunderstand when it comes to BVD <clears throat> is that I think the strain is probably as or more important than whether it's type 1 or type 2. Because I will tell you that in that herd, which was negative as far as type 2 goes, there was no PIs, there was no, nothing happened negative in this herd, even though they were getting a vaccine that only had type 1A in it, which was Singer. And I think the, you know, the only reason that we talk about having type 2 in vaccines is because one vaccine really sucks at, at, at that, okay? And that's NADL. So vaccines that have NADL in them from that strain doesn't give you much cross protection. And we're seeing the same thing with 1B. That NADL does not give us very good cross protection for 1B, but we've done studies with 1B with Singer, and, and, you, and you, you're talking about typically 95% with Singer versus 85% with NADL in terms of, of, of 1B. <coughs> so when we talk about this kind of protection, I think it really, it's not just about whether it's a type one or type two, but what's that strain that's in there to help us make sure that we have a better response. So again, if we generate a good memory response, so here, here we had these cows every, every year, every third year, and there really wasn't any difference. Am I suggesting that we should vaccinate cows every three years? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying we don't understand in, in terms of really how, that, how long duration is, but what, the other thing about vaccination is what is it? It's risk management. So in a dairy, I'm looking at a lot different issue than I'm looking at in a beef cow herd, okay? In terms of, you know, if I'm not bringing replaces in, my herd's relatively close. In terms of beef herd, vaccinating at longer times probably from a risk management standpoint makes sense. But when I'm looking at, in our part of the world, at I-29 corridor, where we have dairies expanding all the time and we're bringing lots of heifers in, the idea that I'm vaccinating more often, what am I doing? I'm trying to manage risk. So I, there's nothing wrong with that. We just need to understand what context that fits in. So again, what we've seen then is <clears throat> this idea that these angiopresenting cells, be it macrophages or dendritic cells, they pick up the antigen, okay, from where we give the vaccine, they carry it then to that drain lymph node so they can interact with T cells. And again, the first thing that they have to do, and you see that right here, 
is they've got to have, make sure they have, they have to have the same antigen that the T cell has. Okay, if they don't have that, nothing's going to happen. Okay? So, you, so you saw the first part of that movie, when the antigen wasn't there, what did those cells do? They came in, looked around for their antigen, and they left. Okay? Then in the second part of that movie, you saw once the vaccine came in, you actually saw that there was actually dendritic cells that were actually in the lymph node. They picked up antigen, but they didn't have, they hadn't gotten the inflammatory response, so they didn't have this second signal. And without that, they couldn't dance with that T cell to actually activate the T cells. Okay, so, act, so, so once they have both of those, so they got, first of all, they have the right antigen, but then they have to be activated, and when they do that, then they'll activate the immune system, and then we'll get a good memory response, okay? And we know that that part of that is going to be tied up in terms of, of are there other stressors going on? So one of the things that we've certainly seen in the feedlot industry is looking at actually delaying vaccination. And part of that is, is to allow this signal to occur and that we're not interfering with that because vaccines are a stressor. Okay? So I want to make sure they're out there far enough that the other stressors that are going on, if those, if those animals are dehydrated, um, they've got a feed change, they were just weaned, all those things have a chance to, to, to kind of go through those before I worry about trying to turn on that vaccine response. So again, we've been seeing that. So, the other, so what you see is we turn on memory, and we also turn, as you see here, is we actually turn on another type of T cell. And typically that's what happens with most of the vaccines. We turn on both a memory response and a B cell response, or antibody response, and typically that, that's what we want. We know sometimes, for example, if I'm looking at young calves and I'm interested in Clostridium perfringens, maybe all I want is some very short-term protection that will last uh, just for a few weeks because I just need to cover those calves just for the first few weeks of life. So maybe then what I want is predominantly a B cell response and just antibody because that's all I need. So, <clears throat> but most cases we want both. We want both a, uh, a memory response and we want to have a B cell response as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about vaccine principles. And the other thing, anytime is that we're going through this that you've got a question, don't be afraid to stop me, okay? Um, don't be afraid to stop me. Um, so again, we know that given a vaccine, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to increase disease resistance, okay? That's, that's the definition of it. And what we know is, is that if you look at a population, and here's the unvaccinated population, and we vaccinate that population, we shift it to the right. Okay, so we, we shift that population to the right, and that's what we're seeing here, okay, that we shift them to the right. But what you'll see is we're saying about this, you know, in terms of level of disease resistance, if we're above 20, that animal's gonna be pretty, good, pretty well protected. But if it's below that, it won't be as protected as well. And so even you know, with the best vaccine, rarely can we shift them that far over. In other words, that all the animals are protected. But again, what we're typically looking at is the concept then that if we get a high enough proportion of the animals that are protected, as the virus moves its way around, it doesn't, it do, you know, it doesn't need all the animals to be protected. So there may be a few that may get sick, but that won't spread it to the rest of them because the, the immunized animals that are actually you have an immune response, are gonna, are gonna keep it in check and not allow it to spread to another susceptible animal. So, so typically we use that, and that's the term of, that we use is herd, herd immunity. Now, I would contend, okay, so as you already heard, so I have a company that does contract research, and we do contract research with all the vaccine companies, and typically what do we do? Okay, <clears throat> we get calves, we bring them in, we have them on, you know, they've been weaned for, for a while. We've, we've tested them. We know exactly what's going on with them. We get them on full feed. Life is good, and then we vaccinate them. And so we'll see 90% of the calves will respond. Well, that, the trouble with that is that's not the real world. I would contend in the real world, what we're looking at in terms of, of what's going on is typically if we get a 70, 80 of them, or 70 to 80% of them to respond, they're going to be protected, and they're going to do for most uh, infectious agents are going to do a pretty good job of protecting the herd. Okay? Now, for foot and mouth disease, we, I mean, we, have to, we have to be uh, much higher than that. And then interestingly, if you look at in the human population, if you, so if you get 70, 80%, or probably about 80, 80, 80 40, 5% of the population uh, uh, that are immunized for mumps or German measles, they'll be protected. But measles, which is what we've been hearing about in the news, you've got to be over 90%. So this whole thing when you know, people not vaccinating kids, when it comes to measles, that's why it's a bigger threat with measles than it is with mumps, because measles is more infectious. <clears throat> and so again, as I said, so th there's no way that you're gonna have 100% of the animals that are gonna respond. Even though you know, people, you know, our clients see all those great advertisements about, we have a guarantee you know, that, that you know, if there's a problem, we're gonna guarantee this vaccine. But what it's based on is the fact that 
One is that herd immunity is going to be high enough to prick, you know, uh, protect with, against BBD and IBR, which although they're infectious, they're not nearly as infectious as some other things could be. And again, so as I said, with most viruses, that's good enough, and I've already explained to you that the concept of herd immunity. So again, when we look at you know, host factors, this whole idea of having lower stress, so trying to minimize the amount of stress before we actually give them the vaccine and that they need to be well hydrated is important and, and good nutrition because the immune system is a major energy pig. Okay? If you're going to get a good immune response, you've got to be able to have that animal uh, responding well. We, we did a study uh, with, with one of our collaborators at uh, SDSU, and what she was doing was she was actually, this is beef cows again, so she was feeding beef cows, these are pregnant beef cows, either feeding them 100% of the NRC requirement in terms of energy or 80%. And then we looked at the calf's response after they were born, and not surprisingly, the calves that were from the cows that had 80% of the NRC were about 15 to 20% less able to produce antibody. They produced less antibody, and their immune system was actually was toned down a little bit. Okay? So again, energy is an important thing, and it's both for, for development and for the animal itself. And then we know the other thing about stress and all I, you know, the word I, I need to take to do a little bit of editing with this particular slide because cortisol is not the enemy here, okay? Stress is the enemy. And stress does more things than turn on cortisol. It turns on inflammatory cytokines as well, which has, a, as we'll talk about in a minute, does what we call dysfunction in the immune system. So I would contend to you that more times than not, I'm not so worried about the immune system being suppressed, is the fact that it's being overstimulated that's actually getting turned on to, to a too high a degree. And again, trying to vac avoid vaccination at times of severe stress, I think, makes great sense. Okay, so let's talk about stress then. So stress then is anything that reduces the immune response capability. And the thing that we know, so as we look at dairy production and as we've gotten more intensive with that, it's certainly more stressful. And anything that, you know, that increases that intensity is going to have an effect on the immune response versus you know, we were in California yesterday, and you know, the famous California cow on the pasture, which I haven't seen too many of those lately, and the extensive, okay, and even in South Dakota, we don't have many of these, where they're, you know, on the, in, the, in the nice spread out formation, and cows munching on grass, and their density is not an issue, then there's less stress. <clears throat> so, if you look at stressors then, in terms of weaning, uh, uh, sales yard, uh, commingling, and these are things you're all aware of, transport, and again, dehydration, some nice work that's been done. This has been done, again, more in the feedlot world, but work that John Richardson did down at, at who's not at Texas a and in Canyon, uh, he actually took, these are six to eight weight cattle, uh, uh, brought them there a long haul, brought the cattle in, put them in the yard for, and then 24 hours after they were in the yard, he pulled a single blood sample on them. And he did just, basically, he just did a CBC on them. So he's looking at white blood cell counts, red blood cell, red blood cell counts, and differentials. And then he looked at whether or not they developed bovine respiratory disease or not. And interesting, one of the major factors, and even, even uh, part of that, of that study was actually they had bulls versus steers, so they actually castrated some of those animals. But I can tell you that the stress of dehydration caused cattle to be about four times more likely to have BRD. And, and so that ends up being, again, that dehydration is a big, a big problem. And then, and then time off feed is another issue. And, I, and, and this sort of hit me in the head when, when I was in practice. Uh, I worked in, uh, with a, a, a guy, one of the first guys to kind of really look at swine herd health. And, but one of the things that we noticed is that if we had people for one reason or another, and this typically was in uh, pigs, say, 60, 80 pounds in the, in the grow finish uh, uh, state, these pigs <coughs> and herds that were endemic for there's a, a, a bacteria called actinobacillus pneumonia related a little bit to histophilus, that if, if we had pigs where that, where that bacteria was around and we had some kind of a non-feed event, okay, so either something happened to one of the legs uh, in, in the feeding system or somebody forgot to feed, order feed, that those pigs were off feed for about 12 hours, that you could almost, it's almost like clockwork, two to three days later, they would have the damnedest outbreak of pneumonia you've seen. And it would be high, this was a high mortality bug. Again, telling us that the importance, and you'll hear more about this when I talk about the microbiome, the idea that what's going on in the gut and in the respiratory, but in the gut in particular, is driving the immune system. Okay? The immune system is dependent on getting signals that come from the digestive tract. Uh, and so then there's also nutritional in terms of deficiencies, 
Uh, and then obviously the, the normal things that one deals with, you know, so a calving, lactation, obviously a huge problem in, or in, as a stressor in dairy cattle compared to beef cattle. And then we have environmental things like cold heat and humidity. And fortunately, uh, you, you know, humidity is not one of your issues. It certainly is where I live. And then vaccination. That vaccination is another thing that, that indeed can be a stressor. And it's not just the fact that you've got to handle animals, but in fact, some of these antigens, and whether we're not talking about gram negatives, uh, or if we're talking about modified live, IBR or BBD, they are stressors. All right, so you've already seen this slide when I was talking about vaccination where I, we just talked about two legs of these three here. So the thing I want to talk about now is the liver. Okay, so the liver has an interesting role when it comes to stress and inflammation. Okay, so the liver turns out to be the, uh, the first immune organ. Okay, so the first immune organ of the body when that calf is developing is the liver. So we do work with BBD, looking at you know, when, does, when does persistence occur. And so we look at, at, at the livers of an 85-day-old calf. And if you look at that liver, there's T cells, there's B cells, there's macrophages, there's red blood cells. All those things are being made in the liver, okay? Because there's no bones yet. So the liver is the first immune organ. And the th interesting thing about the liver, though, is if the liver gets, gets the idea that inflammation is going on, it wants to be an immune organ, and it's not very good at it. It produces these acute phase proteins, and the acute phase proteins, what are they? They're, they're you know, do a nice job in terms of, of dealing with inflammation, but guess what? To make them requires a lot of catabolism. This is, not, this is something now that the liver, instead of being a metabolism machine and de dealing with glucose management and the other things, know what it's doing is now it's breaking, these pro breaking things down to make these proteins to be an immune organ. And there, there was a, some nice work done by a, actually a, a poultry guy at, at uh, UC Davis by the name of Kirk Classing. And what Kirk does, he has, he has a, his model is broilers. He takes the broilers and he gives them endotoxin. Okay, so we all know endotoxin is a major uh, stressor and a, and a major immune activator. So he gave them all, he gave them uh, endotoxin. And then what he did, the lucky graduate students that worked for him, they got to dissect all these chickens out, okay, weigh all these organs up and figure out, okay, when I turn the immune system on, what organ are you going to guess is going to be, have the most weight in, 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 these, in these broilers? Well, you know, you think, well, is it going to be the spleen? That's a, that's a big immune organ. Is it going to be a lymph node? No, it was always the liver. The liver's increased by 30%. So the liver's, instead of being, helping that cow in terms of being a maximizing lactation, what is it doing? It's trying to be an immune organ. It sucks at that, okay? So that animal's not nearly as efficient. And again, when we look at sickness behavior, it's a lot in terms of this, if that liver is activated. And we'll talk a little bit about leaky gut later, but the thing about, when we look about leaky gut, and if again that mucosa is, is, is leaking a little bit, the liver is just downstream of the, portal, uh, of, of the portal circulation. So what's that doing? Again, it's causing that liver to behave like an like a, a immune organ and do something that where it becomes, decreases the efficiency of that animal. Okay, so again, it's the first immune organ. So again, I think oftentimes we think about you know, the animal's immune response, uh, you know, it has some kind of stressor, and then what happens is we have that dip in that, and let's say we, you know, we brought in some new, new calves, and uh, so now there's an increase in the challenge, and we see disease. But I want you to think about it this way instead. I mean, that, certainly that happens, and that's probably, again, kind of our classic definition. But I would contend to you that what happens a lot of the time is that, in fact, the immune system responds, but instead of evening things out, it actually goes over the top. It actually it over responds. And again, I think if you look at, as we start to disease more and more, you'll see that most of the pathology is immunopathology. Okay, it's immune cells that are actually causing the damage. And so being able to maintain what we call homeostasis, trying to, so, so if I've got, I already got a few stressors and now I decide I'm gonna vaccinate or I'm gonna do something else to them, there's one more stressor to push this up, push this up a little bit higher. Now that animal's be able, ability to react is gonna change. And we call that actually, and, and this is what was first characterized in people, a cytokine storm. So when that inflammatory response kind of takes off, and the interesting thing, just like I told you about those pigs, so here we're talking about pigs that were, they, were the, you know, the gut was empty, so they probably had some leaky gut. So the inflammatory response began in the intestinal tract, but that can go systemic, and we talked about that before, where that systemic response now could affect the lung, uh, even though we're talking you know, about a, a feed intake issue, but yet those animals developed a respiratory disease. So again, and we know that viruses, so BBD, and again, this is kind of a strain-dependent thing. We've, we've done some work with this in my lab. 
So I've got some strains of BBD when I put them in with macrophages that don't cause any kind of a pro-inflammatory response, and I have other ones that put it through the roof. The same thing with IBR. But I will tell you that what they do is they turn on inflammatory cytokines, and the ones that you know, they're good at making disease to help us, I think, really this idea that it's more going over the top than going, going, uh, going in the other direction. All right, so I'm going to show you here. So, so neutrophils normally should do. Okay, so when they're recruited by this inflammatory response, what they should do is they should come in, uh, grab a hold of the bacteria that they're supposed to ingest it, and then what they do is they kind of fold up on themselves, something called apoptosis, and the macrophage just kind of eats them up. So they kind of they, they fold in on themselves, and what we see though in, in, in neutrophils after there's, their inflammation is going on is that they go in exactly the opposite direction. So instead of folding up on themselves, and what you'll see in this movie, is you're gonna watch them blow up, okay? So these are neutrophils, and what they're doing is, this is actually, this is a mouse model, but these, this is actually an aspergillus filament, okay? So here you see these neutrophils trying to deal with it, and here, watch this guy. Now, see he's trying to shrink up, but instead of shrinking up, look, what's, look what he does. He goes in the opposite direction, and he blows up, okay? And now he releases all that peroxidase and all the other enzymes that are, in, that are inside that neutrophil in the surrounding tissue. That certainly has a detrimental effect on the pathogen, but what does it do to the tissue around it? it causes collateral damage. Okay? So that neutrophil over-responding, and I would contend to you that most of the lung damage that we see is, yeah, so whether it's Mannheimia or whatever it is, is recruiting things in there, but it's actually neutrophils that are actually, because they can't, they can't go anywhere. So with mastitis, if neutrophils come into the mammary gland, they have an exit strategy. They, go, they, they, can, they, they got a way to go out, or the gut, they can go out. But when it comes to the respiratory tract, they don't have that option. So once they, once they get into the tissue, they last about six hours. They go ahead and they uh, go ahead and they blow up and do their things, and then they cause tissue damage. And that tissue damage, again, I, I know nobody has seen calves that look like this, though. Okay, you know, this is a cat the night before was fine, and now look at, the, look at this lung now. And the interesting thing is, so what's this lung covered with? What is that? It's fibrin, isn't it? Okay. What's the liver make? Most of those proteins that you see that that lung is coated in, or acute phase proteins produced by the liver. Okay, <clears throat> so it's against the immune system, in this case, kind of going amok. Now, I, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Zelnate. So Zelnate was, a, was still on the market from Bayer. A product that was initially sold as it was going to be an immunostimulant. And, and what we know is, in fact, that's not what it does. What it does is it actually keeps macrophages from producing too many cytokines to keep them from to recruit in, recruiting cells. Because its biggest claim to fame is is that when you use Zelnate, you reduce lung lesions and you reduce mortality. And it does that by modulating the immune system. So instead of having big swings, the swings are much smaller. And when they're much smaller, you can deal with that and you can deal with that in terms of recovering uh, the tissue. Because again, we know we're not gonna regenerate lung, okay? Um, and so being able to, to keep that, that homeostasis, that modulation uh, in, in, is, is in that ra small range as we can, the better off we'll be. So again, so when it comes to this with stress, I, I would contend that our problem is turning on the innate immune response and then again trying to, again, we want enough to prevent and control disease. Too much of it, too much of an innate immune response. We get immune pathology, too little. The pathogen wins. And so again, the whole point is trying to maintain homeostasis so that we're somewhere in the middle. So using anti-inflammatories and using other things to try to manage that so that we can keep the innate immune system helping us to prevent control, disease control, but not having dysfunction. One of the more interesting papers I've ever seen is a, was a paper that Barry Bradford did at Kansas State, where he took lactating cows and he gave them aspirin for the first seven days after, uh, after they calved, and he had less metritis, less mastitis, less BRD. So to me, that's, that's, that's something that we need, that we need to, to think about in terms of how can we manage. In, in, in Canada, in some of the feed yards, they don't even think there's no use, if they're going to do metaphylaxis, you know what they use metaphylaxis with? Malaxicam. They give them anti-inflammatories, not worry about antibiotics, so that they can, again, not allow that inflammatory response to get ahead of itself. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about, about this mucosa. I've already alluded to this already about uh, the importance of it. And so the first thing 
I want you to realize is that the largest immune organ in the body are these mucosal cells of, of the, the respiratory tract and of the gut. So these cells that line the gut and line the respiratory tract and line the female reproductive tract are the largest immune organ of the body. We used to think about them what? They're in the secretion and absorption business if they're in the gut. Or if they're, excuse me, if they're in the lung, they're there to clear particles and then obviously as you get further down, important for oxygen exchange and obviously if we're talking about the reproductive tract, we're talking about these cells' job is to do what? To allow that fetus to develop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get to, we'll get to that in a little bit. But the other, well, you know, but so, but the other, so the interesting thing again about this idea of, of managing how much inflammation you have. So if you look at, so BI has a, a viral vaccine, strictly viral, Express Four. Express Four has a tenth of a dose of histophilus in it. How many people knew that? Okay. A tenth of a dose. Not enough to immunize against histophilus but enough to get the immune system's attention in terms of inflammation, okay? So th there's ways to work with that. And there's ways to, 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 to think about how, how to manage that. <coughs> okay, so let's just talk more about this mucosal immune response then. And so these cells, <coughs> so again, we're, we're gonna predominantly, what you're gonna see here mainly are from the gut, uh, but the same, same principles hold true for the respiratory tract and to a lesser degree, but certainly to the, to the reproductive tract, particularly in the uterus. And so what <clears throat> these cells do besides, so they're supposed to absorb, in, absorb nutrients, secrete enzymes, do all those kind of things to enhance the nutritional plane of that animal. But I want you to think about them as an immune cell, okay? So the first thing that this epithelium does, and again, any of those organs that we just talked about or the systems we talked about, is they have mucus on them, don't they? They have goblet cells that produce mucus, and that mucus is absolutely essential to maintain a barrier. You see, you got this term up here, the kill zone. So this mucus, and depending on where you're at in the gut or the respiratory tract, it varies uh, in terms of how, you know, how tightly it adheres. And these cells are also producing things called mucins, which is kind of a way to knit it in. Uh, but again, so that's the first thing. The first thing, you've got to have, you have adequate mucus. Okay? The second thing, and you'll see that right here, the, these little round guys, okay, are something called antimicrobial peptides. These are the body's natural antibiotics. So when we use prebiotics and probiotics, typically what we think, and we're only beginning to kind of break through this, is that we're stimulating these cells to, to one of the things we're doing is stimulating, stimulating these cells to produce some of these guys, okay? And we know different kinds of things, so different components will turn on different types of these antimicrobial peptides. So some of them are against gram negatives. Some of them are against gram positives. Some of them are even against viruses, okay? So again, uh, and that's still to me, and I won't say much more about prebiotics or probiotics than I will right now, and that is, that's one of the things as we can do more research to understand what they do, then you can use them strategically because we know one thing is we're not going to have more antibiotics, and we're certainly not going to have more oral antibiotics. Okay, so the second thing is these antimicrobial peptides. The third thing is something we've already talked about, and that's IgA. Okay, so secretory IgA, so IgA is produced by these B cells, okay, but it has to be and they have on them on their surface something called a J chain, which drives, drives these or draws these two together. But these cells then have a receptor on them, and that's what you see here. So it says it's this. It's, it's called a polyclonal IGR receptor. So they have a receptor that again that they'll bind to, and again species specific. So what they'll do then is they'll grab onto it and then they'll export it to the surface. But when they add this little piece right here, this this increases the half life of these antibodies three to four times, okay? So if they don't pick that up, again, that's why they have to go through the cells, they pick that up and they put them on the surface, okay? That's the third thing in this kill zone then. So we have the mucus itself, and we know that actually mucus itself stimulates the production of IgA, uh, and, and so that zone maintaining itself then helps in terms of keeping the bad guys out. But like I said, at the same time we know that in fact these guys out here are the good guys, which the vast majority of them are good guys, or may also be producing products that are having a positive effect in driving this forward. We know there are some bacteria that the products they produce will increase IgA production, okay? And then the other thing, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. So the first thing that they do is, is make this barrier better, okay? Now the second thing is, and think about whether we're talking about the respiratory tract 
or the GI tract, what are they continually in, or the skin, what are they continually in contact with? Microbes, all the time. So if all they did was respond to it, they'd, nothing, they'd get nothing done, right? So it turns out that by definition, these cells are what we call anti-inflammatory. And, and, they're, and they're, they do that, why? Because there's normal things that are out here that we don't want to have immune response to. That's called tolerance. So what they do then is they actually, they're, they're going to be kind of picky about what they're going to respond to because they don't want to respond to everything to keep, keep things going. Now, in part of that regulation that they have, in being anti-inflammatory, they maintain tight junctions. So tight junctions are these guys right here that knit cells together, and they're also in the reproductive, respiratory, and digestive tract. They hold cells together tight. And they actually, they, they relax and, and contract uh, they, but we know that if you have an anti-inflammatory anti response going on, that, that tightens these up. And when you have an inflammatory response going on, it loosens them up. And then you talk about leaky gut. Okay? So again, when we have animals that are dehydrated, so that would deplete this mucus. Okay? Or, I have, again, or I have an animal that hasn't eaten for a while. The thing to remember is I'm not just feeding the animal. I'm feeding all those bugs. And so if i got an animal that's empty... What's feeding those bugs? And they're, and they're really essential to keep this thing going. And then again, here you see this idea again, if I decrease water intake, I talked about the barrier, but you've already seen in that movie I showed you what, for, for the immune system to work, what do cells have to do? They gotta move from point A to point B. If they can't move, you're not gonna get much of a response. All right, and this is <clears throat> a little bit more about, this is the epithelium. <coughs> And, and it has this kind of own little lymph nodes, and that's what this is showing you. This is called a lymphoid follicle. So these things are in the tonsil. They're in the GI tract. They're in the respiratory tract. We don't see these very often in, in, a, in the reproductive tract unless there's metritis. If you've ever, ever posted a, a you know, cow that's got severe metritis, you'll see these things that almost look like lymph nodes that are, that are underneath the mucosa. And those truly are actually lymphoid follicles, but typically in the reproductive tract, those are, they're a result of metritis. But again, these, they have a little bit different cells here. They're kind of like windows for them to be able to look at antigen and then, again, turn on T cells and B cells. So rather than what you saw in the movie where they're, you know, pick it up from the skin and had to go through the lymphatics and go into the lymph node, here the distance is much shorter. But these cells then will still ultimately go to a draining lymph node and go back to the blood. All right, so let's talk about then the, the, the bugs that are either on the skin. We'll talk mainly in the gut and the respiratory tract here, but what we call the microbiota or the microflora. Okay, so this is the organisms that are found in the body. They're location-specific. They're individual-specific. There's a genetic component to that. We know that if you look at people who have rheumatoid arthritis, they have a different distribution of these bugs than you or I that don't have it. And it turns out, guess what? They're, they're, the bugs that they have are more inflammatory, hence the reason that you see uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And rheumatoid arthritis is too much innate immunity. It's too much production of one of those pro-inflammatory cytokines that I put up there for you before called tumor necrosis factor. Okay, so there's a bunch of these guys, and this is actually in a monogastric, so you could probably put a few more numbers on this when we're talking about a rheumatid, okay? And the vast majority of them are good guys, or commensals, and they outnumber the cells of the body 10 to 100 times as many. And we know they're essential for immune development. So if I take a calf, we have a, at SDSU, we have notobiotic units, so I take that calf, I do the C-section in a bubble, put that calf into, into, into that... Uh, uh, notobiotic unit, and I look at its immune response, guess what, guess what its immune response looks like? A zero. Because they've got to have exposure to the organisms in the environment. And again, colostrum is, fills, that, fills that gap, okay? Because this animal's coming out, what, sterile, and colostrum is there to help, help fill the gap. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about CAS specifically. And so again, the other thing is they're influenced by the host immune status. So again, if I have stressed animals, I'm going to see that those bugs are going to change a little bit. All right, so this is, this is a little bit about the idea of, about, you know, some, for example, some prebiotics that we have with some kind of a yeast digest and all those kind of things. So this is kind of give you a, a, an idea of maybe how those might work. But this is actually work that's been done uh, in the hindgut. Okay, so, you know, we think about, you know, the ileum and we think about the rumen, but we don't think a lot about the hindgut. So everything downstream from the ileum. And so this is, this is work looking at clostridials, and we think usually typically of those as being what? a pathogen, but the vast majority of clostridials are actually commensals. And so what they're showing here is that these clostridials are actually breaking fiber down 
And when they do that, they produce short-chain fatty acids. So what do we think about short-chain fatty acids? We think of them as an energy source. Have you ever thought about them as an immune messenger? There's milk replacers now, so here you see butyrate. There's milk replacers now that put butyrate in there on purpose as an immune modulator. So let's talk about that a little bit. So I, we've talked about, about the barrier function. Now we're going to talk more about this anti-inflammatory side of it. So here you see these short-chain fatty acids hitting these epithelial cells. And now the epithelial cells, so we've already talked about how they produce antimicrobial peptides, and we talked about how they export IgA. But here now, when they get, they get hit with this, they produce a cytokine called TGF-beta, transforming growth factor beta, which then takes what we call naive T cells, so T cells that haven't been activated yet, turns them into a regulatory in cells, which says don't overreact to that. So a regulatory T cell's job is not to over-respond or to respond at all in an inappropriate way. And when they do that, it suppresses the inflammatory response. Okay? And the other thing it does is it produces IL-10. So IL-10 has an effect on that. But IL-10 also affects B cells. I, don't, I just don't have that in this cartoon. Affects B cells, and what does that do? It makes them produce IgA. So it's sort of two for the price of one. You have a, have a modulation of this anti-inflammatory anti response to kind of to keep the gut calm, and at the same time, making more IgA, so I enhance that kill zone. Also, you can see here that they can, they can do this directly. So that they can, this can get absorbed across the epithelium and actually have a direct effect on dendritic cells or T cells, and again, make them regulatory cells. So again, the, you know, the term that we, you know, that, we use, you know, that we use for this, particularly when we talk about the, you know, about the, the gut, is tolerance. Okay? That the idea that you don't over-respond, and we know that people that have, a, you know, that have a, a lactose intolerance or a gluten intolerance, something happened to them that those regulatory cells didn't develop. Something kept them from developing, so now they see those things as being foreign and they respond to it, okay? <clears throat> so this is just kind of puts this, these two things together. So again, the importance of these commensals, okay, and being able to modulate this. So again, here's the first thing we talked about, this barrier enhancement. So again, we're talking about antimicrobial peptides. Uh, we're talking about the thickness of the mucus being affected by these commensal bacteria and, and their metabolites and, and products from them. So here you see butyrate, and then here you see this idea about the hyporesponsiveness. So in keeping them from being, in other words, being anti-inflammatory, so they go over here and have a regulatory cell, and then here you see that term homeostasis again. We talked about homeostasis before when we talked about the immune system. The same thing happens in the gut. The idea that you have a balance here so that this thing is not too much, not too little, but we have a homeostasis that in, in, involves both this barrier, but also in terms of this hyporesponsiveness or anti-inflammatory response. And, and when that doesn't happen, okay, so when we have an inflammatory response occur in the gut, then we get into this whole concept of leaky gut. So here you see a macrophage that's now activated, okay? And they're producing, and there you see that thing I mentioned to you a, a minute ago, TNF. So again, any of the commercials that you see on TV that talk about treating rheumatoid arthritis, they're all antibodies directed against that guy right there. So the whole point is if I, if I can try to get TNF down, so again with rheumatoid arthritis, I'm going to decrease my inflammation and the patient's going to be better off. So again, when that is produced, what it does is it produces, this is a kinase, and kinases, are, their job is to be a signal and to break, thing, you know, to break something down. In this case, what they do, they make a signal, and, and what they do is they break down tight junctions, so now that gut gets leaky. And now the problem you have is this. So now that gets leaky, and so some bacteria come through, and some other things come through the gut, and that macrophage says, ooh, I'm sensing more trouble. Now what happens? What does it do? Produces more, okay? So now it gets into a vicious cycle, okay? So again, being able to, you know, and hopefully keep it localized is good, but trying to, again, to have that be as minimal as possible is important. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about mucosa. Any questions about, about that? So the mucosa and the importance of that, of the, with that, that uh, barrier and that anti-inflammatory response. Have, have you seen that before or not? Does any of this make any sense to you that way or not? Okay. <laughs> and I mean, and, you know, and we're looking at you know, hemorrhagic bowel syndrome and all that in cows. I mean, th these things are all fitting into that, okay? <clears throat> we're just us trying to understand exactly how to make it work. Like, so, so when do we, which magic bullets work best at certain times? And again, we're, that's, it's, we're trying, we're getting there, okay? In terms of the research, trying to understand mode of action and, you know, it's in a certain age and, you know, what do we need to do? Okay, so now let's just, now we're just going to finish out here just talking about uh, 
looking at scars prevention, okay? <clears throat> So again, if we know about, I've already talked a little bit about colostrum, but let me talk a little bit more about it. So you just saw me talk about the importance of anti-inflammatory to the gut. Okay, so now think about that calf. When it hits the ground, it's, it's a, it comes out of a sterile environment, gets that first mouthful of dirt and everything else and, and, and shit in the world that's out there. So guess what colostrum has in it? Anti-inflammatory cytokines to keep that gut. I mean, so they're born actually with the ability to, to actually try to get that gut to not overreact right off the bat, okay? And we know that another thing that's not up there is oligosaccharides. So oligosaccharides, simple sugars, we know that they enhance this microbiome. And even and it, and the other thing we know, just in feeding colostrum, so nice work done in Canada, you feed colostrum, you increase the amount of, cell, of the microbiome in a calf by two to three logs just by feeding colostrum, okay? So it's got nothing to do with the antibody, okay? It's just got to do with the oligosaccharides in it. But again, we're here to talk about, uh, predominantly about the antibodies themselves. So we know they're essential, you know, for preventing uh, diarrhea and respiratory disease. But on the other hand, we're looking at active immunity that, that will have maternal interference, but that's only a problem for parental vaccines, not mucosal vaccines. So let's talk about the cow first. So, so my, back to my title was either side of the fence. We'll start with a cow and then end up with a calf. So again, so the thing, I like the dry cow as a target. And again, the problem that we have in the dry cow is that lots of vaccines could be given during then certainly the, the, the coliform mastitis um, and, and certainly other things that can be given then. So again, trying to time that right, that's always, a, a, that's an issue. But the thing about it is I'm, I, can, I can immunize her and at the same time enhance her colostrum that, so that she can actually help that calf against some of these other diseases. So uh, that's, uh, that's been part of the strategy using a dry cow. But we know that to make this work, certainly you've got to have a, a good plan of nutrition. And I mentioned to you already uh, what that beef cow say where we looked at calves. And we didn't look at colostrum with that, but I'm sure that if we looked at colostrum, we would have seen issues that was you know, lower quality colostrum in the cows that had lower energy. Now, the other thing which you probably don't think a lot about is that by definition, and it doesn't matter just pregnant cows, but any pregnant mammal, by nef definition, has to be immunosuppressed. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean is that half the genes that are in that calf came from the bull. Those are foreign to the cow. So if the cow could you know, recognize that, that those antigens are present, what's it gonna do? It's gonna reject it. It's a graft versus host rejection because there's something in there growing in it that which half of it didn't come from it. Okay? Well, that doesn't happen. Okay. So by, so by definition, they're immunosuppressed. And I'm going to explain that, what that means to you. Most of it's in the placenta. I mean, it's the placenta and the uterus. The systemic effects are, are some. So they're still, you know, from an immune standpoint, maybe a little bit longer. But it's not like we gave them dexamethasone. I mean, it's not that kind of immunosuppression. It's just it's an immunosuppression that's going to keep that calf. And the same thing in moms and any, any other mammal that, that by definition, they have to be immunosuppressed to maintain that pregnancy. All right, so let me just uh, the, the, go off to, uh, the beaten track a little bit here about vaccine labels. Okay, so uh, this label is what's, this is what's on the label now. Okay, and this is a, uh, what I call the cover your ass label. Okay, this product has been shown to be effective or efficacious in healthy animals. A protective immune response may not be elicited if animals are incubating an infectious disease, are malnourished or parasitized, are stressed due to shipment or environmental conditions, or otherwise immunocompromised, or the vaccine is not administered in accordance with label directions. So there's a lot of things to drive through there in terms of why that vaccine didn't work. A lot of them, aren't there? That's your label now, guys, okay? <clears throat> there's not many, not many animals I know that aren't gonna meet some of those, some of those issues, are there? <clears throat> okay? And then we know that in the, in the, when the pregnant cow label says, you know, uh, only, uh, you, you know, these have been tested, uh, but talk to your veterinarian because your veterinarian is going to know the answer, okay? So, uh, but what I want to talk a little bit more about is what's changing with, with, with the label, and that is that we're going away, and this started in 2016, we're going away from this whole four tiers of, of effectiveness, which as far as I was concerned is a statistical uh, uh, label. It wasn't a, really an efficacious label, so you had all this prevention of infection, and probably the best example we have of that is PIs, okay? The idea that, again, that we prevent infection against BBD, that was probably one label claim that was pretty clear in terms of it was or it wasn't. But as you get into these other ones, prevention of disease or aid in the prevention of disease or aid as a control or reduction of disease, 
What did that mean? Okay. What did that mean? <clears throat> so the good news is those are all going away. They're done. Okay. We're down to this single label claim now. So what it says, and unfortunately it goes back to that healthy animal definition that we just saw in the earlier part of the label. This product has been shown to be effective for the vaccination of healthy animals of a certain age or older against you name it. So is it IBR, BBD, whatever it is. And then what has to happen, so now if I'm going to say that my, it's a BBD vaccine and it's for fetal protection, I have to provide the study and the details of the study that was done to get that license. Or if I'm going to say it's about respiratory disease, this is the one that I've done that shows that. Okay, So that's, a, and here's the website where that's at. And right now you'll see there, I went on there in December, there was like only about six or seven. Uh, and then now, uh, magically, uh, because BI changed the name of their company from uh, Boinger Ingelheim Vet Medica to Boinger Ingelheim Animal Health, they had to put all theirs up. Okay, And there's still a little bit of a hole there because anything that was, License before 2007 doesn't have all the details yet, but the, the good news about that is that these things all have to come back up for, for licensure, and when they do, then they're going to have to have the data. They're going to have to generate data. So you're, but you're going to be able to read that now. So instead of seeing the company's data that was whatever it was, or else the other thing which really irked me was a world-famous statement that said, data available upon request. How many guys got that data that, upon request? Okay. We don't have time for that, but, but now you do. You can go on and there's the PDF, okay? There's the PDF, they'll tell you what virus it was, they'll tell you how many animals there were, they'll tell you what they did with the controls, they'll tell you what the clinical signs, and it's something you can read easily. There's in, in tables where it's laid out really pretty nicely. And I, uh, I was on, there's a, AVMA has something called the Council of Biological and Therapeutics, and I was involved in this really the second time around and we actually got this to happen. But, but I, I went off in 2010 and now in 2016, it finally got implemented. But the first time AVMA asked them to do this was in 2002, okay? But, but we finally got there. All right, so enough of my label segue. Um, back to the, to the, to the pregnant cow and in the, my point that I made earlier about <clears throat> that they're immunosuppressants. Like I said, so most of that is in the placenta in the uterus, okay? So and it's a localized cytokine. So it's not, it's not like dexamethasone immunosuppression. But realize that progesterone is immunosuppressive, as is estrogen, okay? Uh, as is testosterone, okay? So any of those sex hormones actually are, they're all immunosuppressive. And it's certainly, we know that cortisol, because it's, it's part of the, of the parturition process, is, you know, released at the end of gestation. That certainly has some effect. And then there's this thing called the bovine pregnancy-associated glycoprotein, which again is something that you just see late term in cows um, that's associated, again, with some immunosuppression. But again, these cows will respond, and it's not like I said, it's not the immunosuppression that I think of with corticosteroids, but by definition, you know, having them vaccinate them a little bit earlier and longer um, is probably you know, wise. So if you look at, at, and this is the acquired immune response, so again, this is response, uh, the memory response at, at the time and, and uh, prior to and at the time of parturition and then two weeks afterwards. So we're looking at 15 days before calving, here's calving, Here's 15 days after calving. And so what you can see is that, you know, the immune response right around calving, uh, and again, this is looking at a parental vaccine. Uh, you certainly probably have seen a, a study that was done in, with mucosal vaccines that showed a little bit better response here than back here at 14 days. Uh, not really too sure what that means, but uh, in terms of protection, because they didn't look at protection, but with a parental vaccine, you can see, I mean, it's pretty clear that there's a, there's a gap there that you've got from about 10 days before to 10 to 14 days afterwards where those cows aren't going to respond very well in terms of their, of their T cell response. So again, back here, in other words, if I'm trying to, to get a better response, if I'm back here at least two weeks back, um, I'm probably in pretty good shape. And again, with good colostrum production, and, uh, you, know, you need to have good heifer development, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to talk much about that, except you know, I certainly am a firm believer on the viral side of having a few doses. I've got to have a couple of doses of modified live to get them set up. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so I'm assuming that I had a good calf vaccination program as well, because again, things that, if, that if are detrimental to that calf are going to affect you know, my, my immune system as I go forward. All right, so let's talk then about what's the ideal interval prior to calving to vaccinate the dam to enhance antibody levels. So again, so the, real, the big question is when, does cow, when do cows make colostrum? When does antibody move from the serum? So again, remember we're taking IgG from, this, from the blood and we're moving it into the mammary gland. 
Okay, so the time from vaccination to antibody peak, the height of the antibody peak, and the slope of the antibody decline. So some of them, it takes a while to get up there, but once they get, get up there, they hold it, and then it comes down slowly. Other ones, it's a little bit more like this. And typically, what determines that is the amount of oil that's in them, okay? Typically, there's more oil, it takes them longer to get up, they hold it longer, and they drop it slower, okay? So oil is typically one of the things that helps with that. And then we know that the other issue that you have when you're dealing with colostrum, and not so much on the, on the dairy side, is obviously, you know, when they calf. In other words, so can I be strategic about, you know, so getting dairy cows, because you know when you're gonna dry them off, you know they're, you know, the, the, they're, they're, what their due date is. We're in beef cattle, um, you know, we often have problems with this, that they were vaccinated long before um, they were gonna calf uh, because they were late calfers, and so then I'm gonna have an effect, effect on colostrum antibody. So again, when it comes to making this colostrum, the big push then is four to six weeks prior to calving, with the biggest push just a couple weeks out. So again, that's kind of where I wanna have my maximum antibody. And I sustained uh, immunoglobulin levels, and again, typically the oil adjuvant products are better at holding that than the non-oil adjuvant. And, and here's the receptors that are involved. So I told you that there's basically receptors that pull that immunoglobulin from the blood and concentrate in the mammary gland. So here we are 14 days prior to calving. In this actual case, this is lambing, but they've shown, shown the same thing in cattle. Seven days, you see a day before, there's lots of them. And then whoosh, as soon as, as, soon as that animal calves, they're gone, okay? Uh, and I already told you that, let me look at IgG1 is by far and away the winner in terms of, of, of antibody. And, again, that's, and I only get that from parental vaccine. So if you're given an intranasal vaccine to dry cows to enhance colostrum, I have one answer for you. Bullshit. It doesn't do anything, okay? Zero, okay? Because what does it turn on? It turns on IgA, okay? What am I making in colostrum? I'm making IgG1, and the only way I can do that is to give a parental vaccine. <coughs> so if we look at, again, about when to vaccinate to get this peak, uh, so again, it depends on the vaccine and whether or not, obviously, they've been vaccinated before, and do we need a, a booster to stimulate that antibody peak? And probably the answer to that is yes. Okay, you know, I said to you about you know, duration of immunity and all those things, but in this case, I'm trying to, Get, again, get peak antibody response up prior to, you know, calving so I can concentrate that. And that's going to, with whatever vaccine is, that's going to go up and it's going to go down, okay, over time. And so I probably, I, this is not something that I can skip on. If I'm looking at a viral, you know, maybe that, that's a different story in terms of a, like a, a respiratory vaccine. But when it comes to, in this case, I'm trying to make colostral antibody, I'm probably going to need to boost it every year. So here you see, looking at the, at the three vaccines that are out there, Guardian, ScarGuard, and ScarBoss, and this is off their label, so 12 weeks out, and then boost again at nine to six, and then annually with a single dose. Uh, Scour Guard, uh, so this doesn't have uh, oil in it, nine to six, boost at six to three, uh, and then annual six to three, and then Scour Boss, again, a, lot, a little more oil in it, 16 to nine, uh, you know, boost four weeks later, and then annual 10 to eight. So um, again, the, typically the more oil that there is, the further out you wanna be, but typically the other side of that is it's gonna sustain it a little bit longer. And this is just, this is actually from a, from a scour boss, uh, uh, but I like the, the, uh, the diagram because it, it does, it puts, us, puts these things down that we just, we just talked about in terms of, you know, I'm not too worried about the number of bandages, I mean, you should be, but I just wanna point out here's the, in terms of what the actual uh, vaccine schedule is. And the other thing to remember, and this is about vaccines in general, but when we vaccinate, particularly again on the primary vaccination, so again, I'm going to, I'm making, this is the assumption I'm going to make. I'm going to make the assumption this animal is ready to get the vaccine. So I don't have any maternal interference. And so the first time that I give that vaccine, I'm going to give the vaccine to them. The T cells are going to proliferate. You just saw that. Now, the other interesting thing about, about T cells and particularly B cells is that as they begin to divide, and B cells in particular, they have a, they have a high rate of mutation, okay? And they do that to actually increase what we call the affinity, the ability to stick onto antigens. But it turns out that for that uh, reaction or for that memory to be generated, the best memory possible, that takes about 17 to 21 days. So it doesn't take 10 days, it doesn't take 14 days, it takes 17 to 21 because what happens is the immune system is selecting. Okay, so it's kind of, it's going through like a good heifer razor and it's culling out the bad ones and it's increasing the good ones. And it takes that whole process 
about 17 to 21 days. So now what I've got at this point, you can see I actually have fewer cells, okay? But what I got is I got cells that are really robust and they're gonna respond. And they're gonna give me a really good response and that's what I'm after. And the interesting thing again is if I've done that and I've done it you know, uh, without a, a whole lot of interference, that memory isn't going anywhere. And I mean, there's been some nice work, even done, again, fortunately, uh, it's been done in beef calves, but you know, look, where they've actually you know, done this in calves at 60 days of age, waited 125 days later to revaccinate, and they compared to that to calves that they had vaccinated 20, so older calves, so, that were, so they vaccinated 21 days before they were gonna wean, and then they did it again at weaning time. And these are, this was a, 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 a on-farm weaning, so it wasn't a transportation weaning. And actually the immune response is as good or better in the ones that had it 125 days. So the thing is, but my point here is once you have memory, if you have good memory, when you come back and give a subsequent dose, doesn't matter so much, okay? It doesn't matter. So now, if I'm dealing with something like alums, okay, so that's probably more modified live and more well adjuvant vaccines. If I'm dealing with alums, this, that story is different. Then I've got to pretty much stick to, to 14 to 21 day interval because Alums don't do a really good job of turning on that inflammatory response. So I got to kind of hit that timing a little bit better. But when I'm talking about modified lives or I'm talking about well adjuvant vaccines, uh, once I've done a good job of established memory, and we've shown that, we've shown that with inactive vaccines with oil, that if, you know, you'll, get, you'll actually get a, a T memory cell response after a single dose, and then you come back 40 days later and you can get a nice amnestic response. Okay, so. Uh, and it would be better with a modified live in, in a naive ammo. That would be, certainly be better uh, quicker with that. All right, so again, when we were talking about this, the peak, again, follow the, you know, what the vaccine labels says. I mean, they, they're based on what they think you know, the best timing is. So again, in theory, that's why we, we do you know, use those labels because they've, they've looked at that. But again, the thing to remember about that is that gestation is variable. And heifers tend to calve on the minus side. So again, those are things that are going to enter into that, you know, even in the perfect world. So again, so start by determining when the expected peak for a given vaccine should occur. And again, this is probably more aimed at a beef than, than dairy because you guys have got a good idea of, of you know, what, when cows are going to calf. Okay? And then time the vaccination to get the peak two weeks prior to the expected calving date. And this is one time. Okay, So this is one time, and I mentioned this earlier, that you know, if you want to get some feel for, you know, okay, you know, how good might my colostrum be or, how, you know, where am I at? If you do look at taking blood samples from those cows, it does correlate well with what you're going to see in terms of the colostrum. So if I've got higher titers, I'm getting higher titers in those cows, it's going to translate into higher titers in the colostrum. Uh, and it's really the only time when I can tell you that that, you know, that makes it, you know, it doesn't tell me more about protection, but it does tell me when it comes to making colostrum in terms of how they'll behave. Okay, we had the, sort of the question before about, or the comment before about gram negatives and you know, how do we deal with those. So we know that there's really, there's two kinds of formulations. There's formulations where the vaccine has already, there's a combination between let's say a viral and a gram negative or a couple, you know, a couple of bacterials that are put together. And those vaccines have been optimized to give you the best response as that formulation is made. Okay, so I don't worry about those too much. I mean, they may not be the most, <laughs> efficacious, but in terms of how they behave, that the interference part of them has been figured out, okay, in terms of optimizing the engine for one and maybe lowering another one so that that, that, you know, that won't be a big issue. But the bigger issue is that what? We don't have the luxury, to, we don't have a vaccine that's got everything we want in. We have to give a couple different vaccines and maybe we're going to have a couple that are going to be, they're going to have gram negatives in them. So I've kind of, this is my list in terms of what I call from most reactive to least reactive. And you see I've got, you know, E. coli mastitis vaccines up you know, near the top or on the top, uh, and, and those because those vaccines are whole cell, and so they're certainly they're reactive. And then below them are two vaccines that are really reactive, and, and that is because they contain a different kind of. L, you know, this is LPS. This is LPS. This is something called LOS, which stands for lipooligosaccharide. These are even shorter chains, and because they're shorter, they seem to be even more reactive. So, pink eye and histophilus are, are very reactive. Uh, they're more reactive than salmonella. Uh, the scour vaccine E. coli typically are, there may be some whole cell, but a lot of them have fimbrae, so it's a kind of a subunit. So that ends up taking me down a little bit lower. Uh, and then when you get the Mannheim and Pastorella, their LPS, they certainly have it, uh, but they're certainly less. And then if you get into subunit vaccines, so if you've got a leukotoxin vaccine or uh, something like Nuplura, which is just uh, outer membrane proteins plus leukotoxin, 
as far as gram negatives, even though they're from gram negative organisms, the amount of LPS that they have in them is basically almost zero because these are recombinant vaccines. And then you'll see my comment there in the red. I mean, and I, and I, you know, I heard this all the time uh, when we talk about, you know, because what a lot of the vaccines have, what they have, five-way lepto in them. And so people say, what's that going to do to my endotoxin stacking? And I'm here to tell you that it does nothing to it, okay? Because the LPS, they're, certainly they're gram-negative bacteria, but the LPS that's in, in, in lepto doesn't have any endotoxic properties, okay? So if there's a problem, if you give an LPS, you know, if, let's say you give a five-way uh, lepto vaccine, if there's an endotoxin problem, it's from a contamination of endotoxin that got in there. It's not from anything with a lepto. Because the lepto's uh, endotoxin is not, in terms of the immune system, is not toxigenic. And then the, the bottom line is, is a, the real world says, you know what, I'm going to have to probably give different formulations of different vaccines to the animals at the same time. Because guess what? I, I know every time I handle them, that's a stressor. So what's worse? You know, running them through nine times to give them nine vaccines, or do I run them through three times and give them three vaccines? And so thing to, to remember, and this is, this is actually an experiment by accident that was done clear back in 1991 where they gave, they were, so they were given IBR and mycoplasma, or excuse me, and, and uh, uh, manheimia, and measuring manheimia responses, and they were actually doing it in a, in a place, the first time they did it, they could only get to the animals on one side of the chute, so they gave it to them on the same side of the neck. The next time they ran them through a different group, another experiment, they could do both sides, and guess what? The animals where they did it on both sides, so either simulating two different lymph nodes had higher manheimia titers than the animals where they gave it on the same side. And again, and that makes sense because where do we say all the action for the vaccine occurs? In the lymph node. So if I isolate those lymph nodes, that response is still, there's still some systemic component to that, but in terms of where those, you saw those cells working and doing their thing, that's in that lymph node. So I want to, so if I can sort of keep it simple, that I have, you know, less, you know, less different, you know, two different vaccines going to the node, um, the better off I'm going to be, okay? All right, um, so let's just talk, just I have a few more slides in, in terms about looking at uh, the effect of, on vaccine uh, and, and vulnerability to antibody. So again, we'll talk first about active antibody and then we'll talk about maternal antibody in the calf. So we'll talk about the calf here in just a little bit. So again, anytime we're looking at vaccines and a vaccine response is the first thing is that you've got to have enough antigenic mass so that the immune system can see it, okay? So the beauty of modified lives, which is from, from a cost standpoint, is what? They multiply and in, their, in, the, in, in, the, in the case of multiplying, they generate their own antigenic mass, okay? The other thing that they do is they generate their own adjuvant. I mean, when you think about adjuvants being a chemical, no. Adjuvant is whatever it takes to get the immune system to recognize it, okay? And so the thing is, when that, when that virus is growing and it's replicating, it's killing cells, that's like one of the biggest danger signals that you can send to the immune system. So that modified live, growing to generate antigenic mass and growing to, to, to give you adjuvant is what you need to have to have a good response. And then we know that that some of the, the antigenic agents are better than others. So, for example, BRSV is, uh, you know, is, is more susceptible to antibody, to pre-existing antibody than other agents. And then we know if there's an adjuvant in there, that's going to have an effect as well. So if there's, I told you, for example, Express has a tenth of a dose. Express 4 has a tenth of a dose of histophil. So that's in there for an adjuvant effect. Uh, we know a Metastem is, a, is, a, you know, is actually is an adjuvant as well. All right, so what a modified live has to do, then I've already told you, you got this antigenic mass, it's got to go in and it's got to replicate. Okay, and we'll show you that in this little cartoon. Uh, and then if it doesn't do that, uh, and, it, and there's already pre existing antibody, so here comes my antigenic mass and it wants to expand. The thing is, how does the immune system know the difference between a vaccine virus and a field virus? And the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't know the difference at all, it just knows that, guess what? I'm supposed to attack IBR, it's IBR, I'm going to attack it. So let me show you that then with these two little um, uh, animations. So this is, this, is, so this is looking at a naive animal, and in some, you know, calf guard is labeled to use it in cows for, uh, you know, to, to enhance colostrum, but the thing to remember about that is if I've got, you know, an animal that's naive for rotocorona, great, I go ahead and I give them the virus, the virus replicates, does its thing, it replicates, now it gets to the, the dendritic cells get hauled to the lymph node, it interacts with T cells and B cells, and now I get my immune response. That's what I'm after, okay? 
But now I've got an animal, okay, so we'll say I've got an animal that, uh, uh, you know, I gave uh, uh, scour guard to or I had given uh, calf guard to previously, so I've already got immunity there. Okay, I've already got immunity there. Now I go ahead and I'm going to, because remember, I'm, I've got to have a, make an antibody here. Because so for antibody, I've got to have lots of antigenic mass. So now I go ahead and I give the vaccine again. I've already got pre-existing antibody, in this case, actively uh, acquired. And so what does that do? That uh, ends up taking the virus out. And so now what happens in terms of that lymph node? Angin doesn't get there. And if I don't get angin over there, what happens? I don't get much of a response. And I can, you know, I, I, there's a lot of dairymen or, or a lot of dairy veterinarians in Wisconsin that uh, have, have taken me up on my challenge to them. So I want you to go ahead and look at these animals and see how good the titers are in animals that are actually immunized. And you'll see that it, their titers don't change hardly a bit. So we already talked about you know, why, you know, when we need to, 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 to boost these. I'm not going to say much more about this. But again, we want to be ahead of the curve. Again, with that two weeks, you know, we, have that, we have maximum antibodies two weeks out. So let's just talk about the calf, and we'll finish up here in just a few minutes. So again, the calf has got all the pieces are there. It's just they don't work so well. Okay? So they're all there. They does not work so well. And remember, they have no antibody. And that actually, as they're developing, their immune response comes along and by... 150 days, we say that they're competent, but that doesn't mean that they'll protect themselves completely, but at least they'll respond. And so they're all there, uh, and they, they gradually improve over the first few weeks of, weeks of life. So like the cow, we talked about this idea that of immunosuppression. The calf comes out, and it's got some immunosuppression too. Now, the interesting thing is that the mucosal response is pretty good, okay? So you've got fetal cortisol, you've got the same things we talked about before, and then we talked about in the colostrum with IL-4 and IL-10, okay? So those things are gonna, have an effect in terms of, of the uh, response of that calf. And if you look at T cells or the blue line and, or the red line, you can see they're pretty stable in terms of the numbers from that one week old calf uh, to about 30 weeks. But B cells change dramatically. And so that's why one of the reasons I say, well, let's wait till at least three weeks of age for part of it is has to do with B cells. The B cells, there aren't a lot of them there early in life. And again, what we're talking about here for the most part, again, is parental vaccines and particularly particularly parental bacterins before three weeks of age. I'll show you a slide here in a minute when it comes to viral vaccines or to intracellular vaccines that respond very, by about seven to eight days of age, they begin to respond. Okay, so, you know, so how early can they respond? And I'll show you that with this slide. So this is looking at a T cell response over here. So they're actually looking in this case, mycoplasma, or excuse me, mycobacterium uh, bulbus. So we're talking about uh, but, but this particular uh, immune response requires a good cellular immune response. So what we're looking at here is the dark ones are seven-day-old calves, and the hatched ones are yearlings. Okay? So they have given them the vaccine either seven days of age or they're a year, and then, and then they go ahead and wait seven weeks later, and they do the recall response. So they give it to them, and now they look to see how good the, how good the memory response is. And you can see the memory response is actually better in the, in the young calves than, than the than the, uh, the yearlings. Statistically, they're about the same, but you can see it was, it was actually better numerically. But over here is the antibody response. So again, here's the, that calf, uh, at, uh, or the, the yearling. At, so they vaccinate that, the yearling here, and, and then they booster it. You can see a nice response there and an amnestic response. Okay, now here's the calf, either the, va the non-vaccinated calves or the vaccinated calves it's at seven days of age, give the vaccine, revaccinate, there's no response. Okay, again, it's because there's just not enough B cells there to respond to this antigen. Okay, because this antigen has to be broken down. It has to be made. Uh, you know, all the things that, that we saw in that lymph node has to be broken down. The T cells have to present it to the to the B cells, and they're not ready to do that. Now, I show you this in terms of the antibody response, but now there's an exception to the rule, and that's clostridials. Clostridial perfringin. These calves will respond earlier, but it's because it's a different kind of antigen that can interact directly with the B cell. It's not something big and complex like TB. It's a very simple toxoid, and the same thing with tetanus. The trouble with that is it's only going to last a short period of time, but maybe that's all you need, just for a couple weeks, because these things are predominantly an IgM response. We talked about IgM before. It doesn't last very long, and there's no memory to it. But if I'm looking at protecting a calf from perfringes in the first three to four weeks of life, it's probably good enough. Yeah. That's the, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, yeah, in terms of how fast that will go. I, we, the, we need to do the studies with that. Believe me, I've talked to them about that because I think it, that's, oil adds a level of complexity to it in terms of how fast that engine can move out. So um, it would seem like it shouldn't, but uh, 
we haven't proven that one way or the other. But that's a, it's a good question, though. Yeah. All right, so this just get, gets us back to the calf. So again, that calf, here's a colostral antibody filling in the gap. So you know, prior to birth, uh, the adaptive response is, you know, takes hit at the time of birth. We fill it in with colostrum. Then the immune system comes back. And again, for mucosal responses, they're right there from the start. But when it comes to parental responses, that takes some time in terms of that to, to, to develop. Uh, and in, in, these are the, are the big four you know, that we look at. And here we're talking particularly today about these three. Uh, you know, and I, I don't see, you know, if we're doing a good job in terms of notching you know, things with BBD, I don't see that as a big problem. And of course, with crypto, we don't have options in terms of vaccination. Okay, so now let's talk, we talked about active you know, interference with the cow, you know, giving it a live vaccine. Now let's look at maternal interference. And you're going to see that, it, you know, it's basically, it's the same thing. The difference, though, with active interference is it doesn't go away. With maternal interference, we know that it does, that that maternal derived immunity is going to decay. And then, it's, you know, at some point then, uh, hopefully we're going to hit that window where that animal is going to respond. And then we'll have, you know, we'll have you know, active immune response to giraffe. So the passive goes down and then the active goes up. And you've already seen this. I'm, you know, the, my point is that, you know what, these things are the same thing. It's just that with maternal interference, it, you know, it's, a, it's a, not the whole animal's life. With active interference, it's its whole life because it's an active response. So what I'm going to show you here, again, is what you've already seen. I'm just going to whip through this because it, my point is, it's the same thing, okay? So here again, so again, and I, so I put it in a n naive, non-suckled calf. That's an Irish term, okay? Uh, it's saying they didn't get colostrum, okay? Uh, rather than, you know, colostrum, you know, what we'd say, colostrum deprived, that sounds bad. Non-suckled sounds politically correct to the Irish. Because I, I did a study for them, and I put that in there. I put in, uh, you know, that they, that they were colostrum deprived and came back. No, non-suckled non is the only term you can use. So anyway. Uh, so anyway, so virus grows, gets to the, you know, gets, gets to the uh, lymph node, does what it's supposed to do. So again, non, didn't have any colostrum antibodies here. Okay, and so got a problem. Now we got calves that got a maternal antibody. I'm giving them an oral vaccine. Uh, the antibody is already out there. Angin comes in contact with it. What does it do? Takes it out. And I don't get my res the response that I'm after. And again, and, that, and, that's a, and that's sort of a fact of life. So again, we know that if you give a vaccine, again, in the face of maternal antibody, okay, so here we got antibody positive, that antigen, you know, can't grow. And even, there's even been some work done with manheimia, so not with, a, not with a live manheimia, but with a killed manheimia that showed that that interference could be as much as up to 90 days. Uh, but again, in the, in the presence of maternal antibody, then you, just, you don't get any kind of a bump. Now you put the boost in there, and again, hopefully if the immunity, the maternal antibody is decreased enough, now you'll see that response. And the animal that didn't have maternal antibody, here's the initial response. And then now when we get the booster, you see it comes much quicker. So again, you know, I showed you that 17 to 21 day, how that, how that bump came up. And now you see it's much quicker in the animal that's already got the, the, the memory response. And again, this is, uh, this is actually a diagram that's, that's, that's in, the, in, in your public, one of your uh, publications. But again, the idea that again, if, if colostrum is absent, then these the viruses can, you know, can st stick on, enter in, and then do what they need to do. But if I've got pre-existing antibody already present, uh, the, again, the vi this antibody doesn't care whether it's vaccine virus or whether it's field virus. So what's it going to do? It's going to neutralize it and then prevent it then from entering into the body. So again, in, in general, the mucosal route certainly is, is always less affected by systemic maternal antibody. Uh, we know that the mucosal route, though, can be highly affected by colostral antibodies if, if that antibody, in particular colostrum, is present. So Perino showed that that was for at least seven days and Van Zandt showed that vaccinating one hour after colostrum, uh, you know, if in calves that were five to six hours old, had no immune response at all. And, in, and, I, and to me, this is really interesting. And here, in control animals, okay, so that, that didn't get any antibody at all, their response still took 14 days before it even came on. So these are animals that didn't have any interference, but it took them 14 days before they can even measure IgA. So if it, you know, so... If, if it's, if, it's, if it's not neutralized, it doesn't seem like the response is very fast to give us much protection, at least certainly for rotor or something that, that occurs much earlier. And again, the mucosal route uh, you know, is responsive from birth. It's less affected by stress than systemic, but it's highly affected by dehydration, okay? Because that gets back to that, those mucus barriers. If that mucus is, is thick and viscous, it makes it harder for things to cross over, makes it harder for the, the system to do what it needs to do. All right. 
and, and one of the you know one of the problems you know is, is finding many studies. When you look for how how long ago some of these studies were done, they were done you know back in the you know in the in the in the seventies or the early nineties. Uh, there's not a lot of them. And I'll, last thing I'll show you here with this is this is from two thousand eight from one of Jeff Smith's. Uh, uh, article that he put together on vaccination programs for CAS for the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, uh, and he talks, you know, specifically about interference. Uh, and in, where challenge studies, they offer some protection as long as they were colostrum deprived or non-suckled. Uh, and however, when it was given to CAS, it also got colostrum. It failed to offer any protection. And these studies demonstrate that vaccine virus present in these products is inactivated by antibodies and colostrum causing failure of these products, and he, this is his recommendation, I do not recommend using oral vaccines to prevent rotor or coronavirus throughout diarrhea and calves. And again, doing, doing passive immunity, in this case he's talking about colostrum, but you can obviously, there's product, other products that, might, that can do that as well. Oh, so my last three slides right here. So my observations, again, and, uh, is that I think we vaccinate cows and calves too much and too soon. And again, this idea when we vaccinate in primary, on the primary vaccination with a parental, I would contend again, if we vaccinate them, we don't see much. Maybe we vaccinate them, but we didn't immunize them. And then this idea that this interval needs to be, you know, it needs to be longer. Now, you know, we're not talking about the parvo puppy here. In other words, you know, if, so if I'm dealing with calves that are, I know there's maternal antibody and I'm giving it shorter intervals, what I'm doing there is I'm not trying to boost those animals. I'm just trying to make sure one of those worked. One of them gave me a primary immune response, so I got a good memory response. Uh, and again, we've already talked at length here about you know, where the optimal time is to get uh, colostral antibodies and, and using the pregnant cow. And then I'm not a big fan of, of the uh, lactating cow in terms of for vaccination, certainly very early, because I mean, she's, got, she's, she's immunosuppressed to start out with, and then on top of that, she's early in her lactation curve, and if I'm going to put energy into something, do I want to put it into an immune response or do I want to put it into milk in the bucket? And I would hope that it would be uh, aimed at the bucket. And then, uh, you know, finally, again, passive antibodies are protective. And again, if we have good colostrum management or good passive antibody management, there's less need to vaccinate that young calf. And, and I, I do like oral or intranasal vaccines for, you know, for viruses, especially if, if BRSV is a problem. And to me, oral scar vaccines... Uh, you saw that delayed response in naive animals and no response in animals with colostrum. I've never been in, we, you know, we, my business is to, is to make calves that are, that are, that are serial negative for vaccination, so we don't feed colostrum. But I can tell you we don't give a scar vaccine, an oral scar vaccine to calves either because I just, I just don't think there's, there's very much efficacy with those. That's my last slide.